Well, it depends on what happens to me. Well, if it's death, it's probably still worth it if it's death. What are you willing to risk to say what you believe? You just heard from Georgetown law student Jin Rei Zhang. Jin Rei grew up in China but moved to the U.S. to attend college and law school. In recent years, he's chosen to speak out against the Chinese government's human rights abuses. He's one of many students who have grappled with the challenges of weighing his beliefs against the costs of voicing them. After moving to Washington, D.C. to study, Jin Rei began engaging in activism. He was inspired by the white paper movement, the protest movement that broke out across China in late 2022 as the country grew increasingly weary of restrictive pandemic rules. Protesting against the Chinese Communist Party has come with some severe consequences for Jin Rei. His family has been harassed by state security, and Jin Rei fears he may never be able to safely return home. And if he does, he may never be able to leave again, or worse. But he believes that silence has a cost too. Here's our conversation. I was really inspired by them seeing you know, all these people who do not really have the freedom to do this are doing this. I am in America. I have this protection for the freedom of speech. So I'm, I'm in a better position to do this. Therefore, I probably have a more obligation to do this. I wrote some articles and also some pamphlets about the zero COVID policy that was happening in China and all the atrocities that's been happening, but uh, that's been really kind of silenced by the Chinese government. I've been trying to tell the Chinese expat community here about this situation that's been going on in China and also people who are not really familiar with China's situation. I'm trying to tell them what this whole situation is about and why in this situation, what they claim to be some measures against, against COVID-19 was actually really harming people. Since you are very young, you are told that you cannot say whatever you want in China. If you say things against the government, the adults in the room would be like, don't say that. But uh, when you're growing up in that environment, and then you learn to speak, uh, speak up against it for the first time, it's really, it triggers a certain kind of response in your mind that uh, you will be in some kind of trouble. For international student activists, obviously the biggest concern is the punishments they may face in their home country. But that doesn't mean that they won't encounter any challenges to their rights to speak here in the U.S. Unfortunately, there have been efforts to silence critics of the Chinese government on American campuses, from Chinese consulates, as well as from some student chapters of the Chinese Students and Scholars Association, known as CSSAs. In recent years, universities including Brandeis, UChicago, the University of Rochester, and more, have seen students press for the censorship or disinvitation of speakers discussing the plight of Tibetans, Uyghurs, or Hong Kongers. And one of those incidents was very close to home for Jin Rei. It took place at DC's George Washington University, where student activists have grown increasingly vocal about human rights abuses in China. Shortly before the 2022 Beijing Olympics began, GW students anonymously posted artwork from Australia-based Chinese artist Badia Chow, satirizing China's human rights records and the Beijing Olympics. GW CSSA called for the responsible students to be punished severely for their naked attack on the Chinese nation. Shockingly, GW agreed, and its president at the time promised to unmask the students and directed the posters to be removed. He changed course after fire and others objected, but the damage was done. It sent a message to Chinese students that if they anonymously criticize their government, they may have to fear not just consequences at home, but university sanctions too. I've long held political opinions against the CCP's authoritarianism and its many past atrocities. However, fear of retaliation had kept me from speaking out publicly against their regime. In the case where the authoritarian government of your home country already knows your personal information, then I personally really would suggest just go for it. They already know. What else can they do? As dissidents like Jin Rei know all too well, there can be consequences to speaking their minds, and their families often find themselves targets. This type of retaliation is called transnational repression. Sadly, this was the case for Jin Rei, who recently went public with the harassment his family faced from Chinese state security forces. It takes a special kind of authoritarian regime to really actually harass people who are abroad in person. So they do something that is more in their range of abilities and also more convenient for them, which is trying to harass the families and try, try to hold the families of these 
uh, overseas activists uh, in hostage. I understand that state security, you know, visited your parents' home. Um, can you talk about that? Sure. So the harassment for me first came about in late June of this year. That was the 29th of June. I got a very confused phone call from my sister because a police officer called my sister. The officer said, well, he suspected to be involved in this organization called the Torch on the Potomac, which is also not the real name of this organization. <laughs> and she said, no, I don't, I haven't heard anything about that. And the police officer said, well, the papers say so. So you have to tell us where all your family members live. And then like several days later, we'll do the investigation. And my sister had to comply. So she gave them the addresses of all my family members. And then that was in early July, the 4th of July. I was awake early in the morning, probably 5 a.m. I saw that on WeChat, I got 20 or something messages from my sister and from my mother. And I was again confused, but so I called them by giving them a Zoom link because none of the other channels of communication is really secure. Earlier that afternoon, the state security people came and then they took my father away after telling my mother and father that I was suspected to be involved in this organization. And then they took my father to the local police station to investigate him about the history of my fault. Since uh, from when I was growing up, how was I thinking, uh, what was my opinion about the Chinese government? And also, if he knew that I was involved in uh, anti-Chinese uh, authoritarianism activities in America. And uh, that went on for like more than two hours. And then my, they released my father after urging my father to let me be really patriotic and supportive of the Chinese communist uh, regime. Months later, after you had kind of gone public with your story, um, you said, you know, they, there was another visit. So what happened then? So that was probably in late August when somebody from Radio Free Asia reached out to me about some other question about, uh, I think, surveillance in the school system of China. I said, well, this, I don't have any information about that. I haven't had experience with that, but uh, I've been, my family has been harassing China. Do you want to maybe do a story about that? Mm -hmm. And they said, sure, because they heard about that before. And then they finally had some, uh, some contact who has personally been harassed, I think. So they, uh, so they interviewed me on the main campus of Georgetown. They did an interview in Mandarin. And after that came out several days later, uh, when my father was working in this office, he sent me a message on WeChat saying, what have you done this time? The, the local leader of the Communist Party is trying to see me. Mm -hmm. like, Why is this happening? Why are they, what did you do again? First I said, uh, not, not much. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, they, they say it's really serious this time. I said, okay, so I spoke to Radio Free Asia about uh, this kind of harassment that you guys have faced. He said, well, now they're mad again. So I said, well, it's, I didn't say anything that the Chinese government didn't know before. It's all the information that they have. They harassed me themselves. They should know. <laughs> and so later in the day, the party official came to my father's office to see my father and presented my father with the transcripts of my WeChat uh, text records between me and my mother and me and my sister, where I tried to tell my mother and sister about how this kind of authoritarian regime in China is hurting people and uh, you should really be actively more aware of that. Mm -hmm. They showed my father that, and also they showed my father the report from Radio Free Asia, and then really urged my father to let me stop and then required that my father sent messages to me urging me to stop mm -hmm. and then they required me to respond positively that I would stop. If I go back, I fear a lot of different kinds of punishments because uh, right now if I go back, there's a punishment of revoking your passport. That is the easiest one. So when you go into the customs, they'll check in the database and then they'll see 
oh, this person has done this and that's against the Chinese state. And then they would try to cancel your passport so that you'll never be able to leave China again. So this is on the border of uh, grounding you in China. But China is such a l large country that you cannot probably call itself grounding, <laughs> but uh, it's kind of grounding. Given the threats and coercion Jin Rei and his family have faced from Chinese state security forces, it may seem surprising that he is not concealing his identity. Some politically active students from China or other authoritarian countries attempt to hide their names. But Jin Rei is an anonymous, and he says speaking publicly under one's real identity involves a complex decision-making process to weigh the existing risks and realities. And he is aware that authorities' knowledge of his identity may permanently alter the course of his life. So obviously it's a very courageous decision to go forward with your real identity, show people your face, your, your name. And I know a lot of students in your shoes make the decision not to do that. Can you tell me you know, how you decided that you were willing to speak under your real name? Uh, I think this should be approached very methodically. So we were simply trying to amplify this voice of supporting democracy in China. How much of a need is there for you to speak with your real name? There's probably not a lot of real need for you to speak in your real name because people know you are genuinely supportive of this cause. But when there is a situation where the Chinese government already knows your involvement in this kind of activism and they already know your name, then is there any additional harm to speaking out? It's a question that you should consider if you're trying to speak out. Is there the possibility that you might not be able to return home, that you might have a permanent physical separation from your family? I think there is a very solid risk for that because, uh, as I said before, there is many different kinds of punishment that the Chinese government can dole out if I go to China while still being on their watch list. It's kind of a spooky game. Uh, <laughs> come to China if you dare. <laughs> See what happens. It's not a game you necessarily want to play. Yes. Either way, no matter what you do, um, you're losing something. Um, so how do you decide if that, that risk is worth it? Well, you have to decide the risk that's involved when you are not speaking out too. When you are not speaking out, you are under a lot of suppression. You're under a lot of fear. But when you speak out, the fear can no longer stop you. And when you speak out, you're doing something that is beneficial for China in the long term. And there, as long as you're speaking out, there is a non-zero possibility that things are going to work out and there's going to be more civil liberty and uh, more political participation by the people in China. So I think there is a lot to be gained. That's such a fascinating way to look at it, because most people think, what are the consequences of doing this? But people rarely think, what are the consequences of not doing it? And so I think that's such a powerful way to look at it. Do you think you know, everyone has a moral responsibility to figure out where they can further justice in the world? I think if they're willing to take on this uh, responsibility, it is very good. It is uh, very beneficial for the world, but uh, sometimes people have other priorities in life and uh, sometimes people might choose differently. Sometimes people are more vulnerable in the hands of authoritarian regimes. Sure. Like, I, will, I, I personally would not argue that people who are living in China, especially the more vulnerable groups like Tibetans and Uyghurs, I wouldn't say they have a moral responsibility to be very adamant that the Chinese government do their changes. But still, you see a lot of Tibetans and Uyghurs saying these things. And uh, yeah, I think that really speaks to the bravery of these peoples. You know, I'd love to hear if you have any advice for students that might be in your shoes, that come from a country that might be authoritarian, that want to speak out, but they're afraid of what might happen. Is there any advice you could give them? My advice would be to take really calculated risks. If you are comfortable with uh, putting yourself out there and speaking these things that are uh, supporting things like democracy and civil liberties in your country, whether doing all these in person or with a, another identity or writing things anonymously online. Well, there's different forms of advocacy that you can do. One of the greatest threats facing free expression today is transnational repression. Individuals who speak out are threatened, their families are put at risk, 
and others watching from the sidelines may choose to stay silent rather than risk the ire of an authoritarian. But for all the harm it causes, Jinri argues that this suppression should in some ways encourage activists because it's ultimately an acknowledgement of the power of protest. Actually, the suppression that's being done by the Chinese regime really gives me hope. Really? Because it shows that they're really afraid of all these kind of activism, even really tri trivial ones, they're really afraid. And they're trying to uh, shut down any kind of dissent that's coming from inside of the country. And I think that shows really a kind of fear that uh, the country is going to be not stable if many people have heard of these other stories of the dissidents. So when maintaining order and stability is at the top of the pile for the Chinese government, it's natural to think that uh, it's going to be really unstable if people know a lot about the opinion of the dissidents in China. So their fear gives me hope. Mm -hmm.